Howdy! This screencast is to help you annotate Gwen Harwood's poem, Father and Child. It is expected that you have already read through the poem and have a holistic understanding of Harwood's storyline and perspective. Now, Module C requires you to have an understanding of the aesthetics of language. This means that you shouldn't be annotating for every little technique, but instead looking for patterns in her poetry or features that are used predominantly by Harwood herself. Some of these could include the diptych structure, imagery, symbolism, motif, juxtaposition, and intertextuality. Then when you get to writing your imaginative, discursive, or persuasive texts, you can make links between how the prescribed authors use these features in their writing and how you can use them in your own. Just some context. So Gwen Harwood is regarded as one of Australia's finest poets, publishing over 420 pieces of work. She passed away in December 1995, but won numerous poetry prizes and awards when alive. She even has an award named after her, the Gwen Harwood Poetry Prize, that recognises an outstanding poem or suite of poetry in Australia. Her poem, Father and Child, looks at an intense moment. However, as the poem goes on, it also reflects the timeless relationship between a father and their child through both the lens of sweet innocence, nostalgic hindsight, and the transient nature of life and death. All right, on to annotating. Well, the first thing we need to look at is uh, the title, okay? The title is Father and Child, and we can kind of note that it gives us an immediate perspective, at least who the characters or the voices are going to be, the personas are going to be within the poem. Also note that the child is genderless, so meaning that it can be applied to any father-child uh, relationship, trying to give it that universality. The second big thing we can note is the structure of the poem. So you can see that it's broken up into two. The first is named Barn Owl and the second is named Nightfall. All right, so we kind of already get this idea about this diptych structure that it's split in two for the poem. And for those who don't know what a diptych structure is, well, it's often used in reference to films or pieces of literature or art that form a complementary pair. So when these two parts are taken together, they are supposed to kind of illuminate or complement each other on their perspectives, on their storyline, on their ideas, etc. You really kind of, you need one and the other to understand the relationship or the storyline between them, okay? So you can't really have one without the other in that regard. And I think that also plays into the fact that the perspectives or the voices that we're getting here are the father and the child. We can't have the child without the father. And also this interconnection that we have between, you know, their bloodline and that really, that really special relationship that's formed. So why does Harwood use a diptych structure? Well, she gives us a contrast. I think between innocence and maturity between the father and, and the, uh, the child and it allows the audience to kind of witness this timeless relationship between any father and their child themselves and we have to read the poem holistically we have to read the ideas within barn owl and apply what we know then to the storyline or the plot within nightfall because they they interconnect the second thing which we can note just looking and uh, reading throughout reading through the whole poem is Harwood's particular use of imagery, symbolism and motif. For example, she uses a lot of um, motifs and, and uh, symbols on sleep, on death, on the idea of sight, as well as light in, in opposing death and also the idea of birds. Okay, so we have obviously the owl that features in the first one and we will get to find out that some birds that feature in the second part of the diptych. So where can we find these particular motifs and symbols and pieces of imagery? Well, let's have a look. I'm going to use orange today. I'm in yellow. All right, 
Well, it opens up with daybreak, the household slept. Okay, so daybreak gives us, it's morning, it's a new day, right? It starts with this light motif, okay, of daybreak, of morning, of the sun, particularly when he says, blessed, blessed by the sun. The child, we get, the child dreams, but it's woken up, okay? They're woken up in the middle of the night, or at least the early morning. We assume this sense of early innocence, but also this powerlessness that's established for both the child and eventually once we meet the owl. The other big thing we get in the, in the opening is the gun. Now, this is one of her, I would say, one of her examples of um, great juxtaposition or contrast, if you like. When we think about a poem named Father and Child, the expectation is of perhaps a doting father and their son or daughter. But this is actually subverted or it's challenged as the reader then learns that this is more of a sinister poem, particularly than expected. We don't, we don't necessarily assume in the beginning that this, the child or the father is going to have a gun. But that's where she kind of plays around with our expectations for the poem and where it goes. So we know that the that the child has woken up. Um, we know that there is an owl at some point. My prize who swooped home at this hour, okay, with daylight riddled eyes. Here's that link back to, uh, again, that light motif and the early morning part of a new day of waking up. Then we start to delve into the more, like the more sinister, the more solemn parts of the poem when it mentions death. So we've got holding my breath in urine-scented hay, master of life and death. Now, this master of life and death part, we're looking both at the fact that they're, they've got a gun, okay, and that gun perhaps is, is this personification of the, um, the master of life and death. But the death here symbolises the powerlessness of transient beings, right, in the face of death. And the transient being not only just humans, in our capacity to do what we do, but also I think the owl. The death here is eventually going to be the owl and it is described in quite kind of graphic and, and vivid imagery. Moving on. In the second stanza here, we know that she has shot the owl. My first shot struck. He swayed, ruined, beating his only wing as I watched afraid by the fallen gun, a lonely child who believed death clean and final, not this obscene bundle of stuff that dropped and dribbled through the loose straw tangling in boughs and hopped blindly closer. Well, here we get this idea of hurt, of pain, and really not much understanding from whoever shot which we assume is the, the young girl or young child, I should say. Um, we understand here that these types of words, afraid, lonely, not final, this bundle of stuff, these are all kind of words to describe this sense of innocence, that the, that the child doesn't really understand the gravity or the severity of what they've just done, but also that this the owl was shot, what we presume to be the wing, because it says beating his only wing, and that the, the owl is kind of, you know, in pain and the child sees this. She talks about the eyes. I saw those eyes that did not mirror my cruelty. And what we get, what we get here is kind of a suspended moment where the eyes of the owl and the eyes of the child are looking directly into one another. Two very innocent beings, one just there because they're in a barn and two because they're being either coerced or asked by uh, their father to attempt to kill the owl. And it's quite difficult, um, quite difficult to understand the harshness or, the, or the, the vivid imagery that's presented here. But we've got this suspended moment that shows us that, that there is some type of connection between the owl and the child. We've got another um, light motif here. So the wrecked thing that could not bear the light. 
nor hide hobbled in its own blood. The light motif that is probably trying to symbolize this idea of blindness or not being able to see, it symbolizes the loss of the senses, right? The loss of childhood innocence and also this underlying ignorance to the finality of the owl's death. And the ignorance, I think, comes from both the fact that this is a child and that they are learning something or learning a very, you know, harsh kind of lesson about the world. Then we get one of the only two pieces of dialogue throughout the whole poem. The father says, end what you have begun. Okay, a very definitive statement if you want to talk about mod modality, but also uh, a, a moment of direction from a strong father figure to their child. We then get the finality of it. I fired, the blank eyes shone into mine and slept. We've got the continuation of this innocence about the death of the owl, about the blank eyes that shone once into mine and then slept. The innocence of the fact that it's not about the death of the bird, it's not about the death of the owl, it's actually that the, the owl's eyes have closed now and could look like they're sleeping. So the owl is now pictured um, sleeping and it's a much softer euphemism than just talking about death. So euphemisms are often used to mask the harshness of situations and Harwood is indicating that the child, even though holding a gun, has an inability to understand the shocking nature of death itself. Then we get this beautiful little painting kind of uh, around the father and the daughter, or the father and the child, I should say. I think I keep saying daughter because I assume that from Harwood's perspective, um, it's talking about her. But we get this real kind of paternal instinct here. I leaned my head upon my father's arm and wept. Owl blind and early son for what I had begun. Well, you've got this light motif again that's coming through, okay, early morning, day, daybreak, all right, a new day. And the fact that she has to end or understand what she had begun. Now, we're starting to think about a new life, a new perspective all right, on the world and on the actions that the child just committed. That's really kind of the, the, the stuff we can talk about in the very first um, part of the poem, in the first part of the, the diptych structure. So then we move on to the second part, nightfall. Well, you can already guess that the heading for the second part here is looking at a different time of day. We are continuing on from a different time, from early morning, from, like we said, a new day, and now moving into nightfall. However, the poem really does start with um, a technique called analepsis. And this is just a, a fancy kind of word here for the fact that the second half of the diptych moves ahead in narrative time. So not only do we get the difference between daybreak and nightfall, but we get the fact that this the second part of the diptych structure is, is very much about moving ahead in narrative time, 40 years later to be exact. So she's starting to talk or the persona is starting to talk about the memories and things like that that have come now. We get the connection here to, uh, to the title of the poem and the fact that we are now sort of looking back into the past 40 years later. Howard uses a really great uh, intertextual reference here, an intertextual allusion. And what she's actually referring to is um, the ripeness is plainly all, quote. It's a line from Shakespeare's King Lear. And the Shakespearean quote goes something like this. Men must endure their going hence, even as they're coming hither ripeness is all. So King Lear is actually speaking to his daughter Cordelia as he makes peace with his child before his death at the end of the play. So the child in King Lear and the father are coming to peace with their relationship with one another. Now I think Harwood is using the quote here to talk about the inevitability of death but also appreciating and savouring life like making the most out of every moment until the end. 
which when we reflect on what's happened in the first part of the di diptych about this innocent owl whose life is shortly ended, uh, we can kind of get that connection or at least the dis like the distinguishing features between the owl and its life being over as well as the longevity of the father four years later who is now obviously heading towards some type of death or some type of demise. So we get these kind of cute moments where they link hand in hand and we assume that they're walking kind of through the streets. And here we get another connection back to the birds. So birds crowd in flowering trees, sunset exalts its known symbol of transience. We get the, this continuation of the imagery, right, about their, their walker that they're taking and the, the light and the bird motif that come back. The idea of the bird this time is associated with the imagery of the natural world and the sunsets here that are signifying the end of the day, using that, that beautiful kind of lights and oranges at the end of the day to symbolise the end of life as well. We get this really nice juxtaposition in words or, or contrast in words here, ancient innocence. Okay, this juxtaposition of time and the incessant nature between life and death of this ancient innocence. You can talk about wisdom, talk about maturity versus, you know, youth and youthfulness. Then she also continues with some more symbolism of death. So let us walk for this hour as if death had no power or were no more than sleep. The symbolism of death here is to indicate the father on the precipice of his own life or the precipice of his own death and also personifies death for the man, as if death had no power. Then we get, you keep a child's delight forever in birds, flowers, shivery grass. I name them as we pass. This is what connects back with the bird motif, as well as the idea of, of innocence and youth. Using these soft, placid, kind of nostalgic tones to the words represents the freedom of the child's innocence not necessarily the freedom of death as well, but uh, the fact that there's there's a moment here of reminiscence, all right, of soulful, um, soulful nostalgia as we look back into the past and a child's delight in what memories they keep for themselves. Then into the last stanza. Here we get the other piece of dialogue. So there are only two bits of dialogue in the whole poem. Be your tears wet. Well, this part comes from the father. No, sorry, you speak as if air touched a string near breaking point. It's actually the daughter talking to the father in this instance. So she's noticing that he is crying. And these two pieces of dialogue we look at the father and how the father figure or the father role has changed. So in the very first stanza or in the very first part of the, the diptych poem, he is the guide, right? He's a guide for the daughter. He is leading his daughter through this kind of experience of not only, you know, um, killing the, the owl but also in dealing with it. He doesn't really convey any type of emotion in response to the owl's death. But as we move on, in the second part here, we're appealing more to the emotional side or the emotional relationship between the father and his child, okay? He encourages, encouraging her to cry or, or she's encouraging him to feel rather than suppress any type of feelings that were perhaps done in the first part of the structure. So this subtle use of dialogue, it's really significant in the whole poem. It helps us kind of indicate the tone, the more reflective tone of the poem and how the father figure or the father role changes over time, okay, where the father is the main, the main um, role model for the child and then later in life where the child actually has to be the helper, the carer, the supporter to the father in his age. He goes from being an adversarial figure who is, you know, probably disciplinary to someone who then has to be provided comfort um, and has to kind of understand and go through the process of nearing death. The last little bits we get in here is the way that she describes 
the, or the way that the persona, sorry, describes the father. So we've got the motif of death that comes back. Your day and night are one. And now we get this idea of a respectful man who's described as an old king. And an old king, again, on the precipice of death or in reflecting and looking back at his life. We also get this kind of contrast at the end about um, the child and which you turn home with the child, once quick to mischief, grown to learn what sorrows. In the end, no words, no tears can mend. This final, this final line here has a really nice kind of throwback or a nice circular structure, not only to the beginning of a new day and the end of a, of a new day, but the fact of this end of life part. And ju it's juxtaposed against the final lines of Barn Owl as well that talk about, you know, start what you or end what you have begun. And then here we've got the death of the father, just going through incessantly, you know, this circle of life and how the roles and relationships of a father and their child can change. I also wanted to reflect a little bit on, um, on the fact of juxtaposition and the fact that the, the entire poem almost works as an entire juxtaposition itself. So we get a couple of things that are juxtaposed throughout the whole poem. We get this maturity and innocence okay, or the, the wisdom and youthfulness. We obviously get the father and the child. We get also the strong um, male figure versus, you know, the, the weak or the younger um, child and the old and the young part. Now, a lot of the juxtaposition here is to emphasise this transition, okay, between, I think, maturation or ageing, um, the fact that in her youth, the character or the persona believed that death was kind of static or that death was also kind of horrific because um, the child ends up kind of leaning next to the father. And, however, it eventually transitions into adulthood when the persona realises that this is not the case, when the persona is there, you know, helping and supporting and caring for their father, that death can be painful and it encompasses a large range of emotional and physical both burdens um, and understanding. The juxtaposition also kind of notes about the way that the roles change between the father and daughter, which we've kind of spoken on, that the father no longer has this immense energy and support for the daughter, but then later in life uh, really requires that kind of emotional stability and emotional support from, um, from the child instead. So I guess we kind of look at the fact that, you know, this, this circular nature of life and death is not only meant to be thought of and understood by humans, but also how something as small as, you know, taking the life of a barn owl, how that is also a reflective and introspective moment for a young child and a father to both, you know, connect on and understand where death sits and where the ideas and the values of death sits between a father and their child. And that is Father and Child by Gwen Harwood. Thanks for listening.